Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Welcome to Labor Vision. My name is Andrea James Gomez. I'm the program director at the Rhode Island Institute for Labor Studies and Research. I'm very happy to be back with two former guests. We have Mike Whitaker and Dave Cookson from Beacon Mutual Insurance Company, uh, who are with the Loss Prevention Pro uh, Department. So I know last time that y'all were here, we talked a little bit about what Beacon is on the big picture. So why don't we go a little bit more into the training programs and resources that you all provide. Um, what type of training is offered to policyholders and their employees? Sure, first, uh, thanks for having us back. This is yes. great. It's good to be here again. Uh, the types of training that we offer to policyholders, we, we really have, have three primary types. We have what we call open seminars, what we do, okay. which we do at our facility. We have on-site training, and we have the Beacon Online University, where we offer online training. Between the three and the fact that we do training um, for various uh, employers, various policyholders at all times of the day, we do weekend training, we do off-shift training. So our training motto is anywhere, anytime, any place, we can do it. So. It's great that you provide so much access to these trainings. Can we break them down just a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, can you tell us something, a little bit more about the open seminars? Sure. Um, let me, I guess, start out by talking a little bit about Beacon and the loss prevention training. Uh, we have a training center at our facility. It's conveniently located right off of the airport connector. It's in the central part of the state. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful facility. All of our policyholders are obviously welcome to attend the open mm -hmm. seminars there. We, Beacon is a, uh, an authorized National, tra National Safety Council training center. So we do a lot of work with a very respected organization like the National Safety Council. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, being an authorized training center allows us to teach some of their programs, for instance, uh, we offer a four-hour defensive driving program. We offer forklift operator training and forklift train the trainer training where we train our policyholders how to train their employees. We do all that in conjunction or in coordination with the National Safety Council. We also, as part of our staff, which we talked about in the previous segment, we have nine highly trained consultants that, that, that work in the loss prevention department who do the majority of this training. Several of those, we actually have four, who are uh, certified OSHA outreach trainers. So they're able to conduct OSHA outreach training for our policyholders, typically OSHA 10-hour training mm -hmm. for general industry, OSHA 10-hour training for construction, which is a pretty highly sought-after type of training. Mm -hmm. So we're very happy to be able to do that and offer that training on a regular basis for our policyholders. In addition to that, the open seminars, um, we pretty much offer about 70 topics each year. Wow. And I say about, it fluctuates, mm -hmm. but we, we typically hold between 50 to 60 open seminars annually at Beacon attended by several thousand policyholders. We do on-site training each year. We do any topic that we do in the open format, we will do on-site. So for the right number of people at any given policyholder location, we'll take that training on the road. And we do more of that than we do anything. And actually, in the vast majority of that is ergonomic training, healthy back training. It's not limited to ergonomic training, mm -hmm. but we train 14,000 Rhode Island workers each year at their place of employment. So the numbers, when we look at those over like a five-year period, we could mm -hmm. nearly fill Gillette Stadium with the number yeah. of people that we trained in just wow. the last five years. And then lastly, we have the Beacon Online University, which is our online training forum. And the Beacon Online University today, uh, we've, in our 10th year, we have 13,000 registered users who have taken over 30,000 courses. There are over 100 safety courses to choose from. We have eight different campuses on the university, and again, this is, this, is, uh, this is all at no additional charge to our policyholders. It's, it's like all of our services, they're free to policyholders. We have 100 different courses on eight campuses, everything from construction, healthcare, municipal safety. There's a, uh, there's a Spanish campus where our, our most popular online courses are also available in Spanish as well. Oh, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a pretty robust training mm -hmm. program. We're very proud of it. And we'll also do some seasonal training. Okay. So based on the time of year, we'll look to see what is, what's going on at this time. Um, not too long ago, we had done some safety training on landscaping. Mm -hmm. So before landscaping really got into the swing of things, there was still some snow on the ground, mm -hmm. we actually hosted a class on landscaping safety. Uh, 
few years ago when we had that awful winter, we were finding more and more people up on rooftops. We now have a rooftop snow removal session oh. to talk with individuals who may go up on the roof to do any type of snow removal. Uh, because if people go up there and they haven't marked it properly, if they're not using the, the proper precautions, it's very easy for them to fall off. Um, we'll also look at things like working outdoors. You know, what can people do to protect themselves, whether it's from the heat, poison ivy, mm -hmm. or if they're using a piece of equipment, maybe they haven't used it in six months because it's been in storage. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of things that we try to do with the employers and the employees so that they understand what they need to do. Yeah, that's so wonderful that you all take the time to figure out what needs to be really talked about and adapt and, and create trainings to, to match that up. That's wonderful. Is there any additional information you wanted to share on the either on-site trainings or the... In terms of the open seminars, it's very easy for policyholders to register. Okay. Um, they can go to our website, which is www.beaconmutual.com, okay. and they can click right on the bottom. It says safety and training. Mm -hmm. And when they go there, they can either register for a class, they can look at the seminar description, or if they if they wanted to, they could go to some of our other resources. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for them to see the seminars, um, to register for the seminars, and to basically follow up on the, that type of training. Um, the other things that they can do within the, with the website, mm -hmm. the other resources we have is we have safety alerts and ergonomic okay. bulletins. Um, safety alerts are one-page little um, informational sheets mm -hmm. on certain topics. Uh, one of them that's going to be Going out soon is beat the heat, although it's a little cold today. <laughs> um, th the heat is coming is. sooner or later. Mm -hmm. um, we have some that are on topics such as like poison ivy. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have our ergonomic bulletins. Again, they're one page, and they might be on something as simple as setting up a workstation, how to adjust a chair properly. Mm -hmm. Most people have a good chair, but if they're not told how to adjust it properly, they could actually develop bad sitting habits. Mm -hmm. So what companies will do with those resources will vary. They may use it for um, a toolbox talk mm -hmm. to get all the employees together to talk with them about what they can do to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. They may use it as a payroll stuffer. Um, or some organizations, what they'll do is they'll go to our website, they'll print down either safety alerts or ergonomic bulletins, and they'll use them as part of their new hire orientation, mm -hmm. which is very good because then the employees can take that information, they can take it with them, they can refer back to it because as a new hire, you're bombarded yeah. with a lot of information. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and you're like, well, my chair isn't quite mm -hmm. adjusted properly, what can I do? So those are some of the things, just some of the items that we have on our website, and we're always trying to add additional um, content to it. Yeah. And just in terms of uh, numbers, we have approximately 75 safety alerts, again, uh, on various topics, available in English and Spanish. And the same with the ergonomic bulletins. Mm -hmm. We have 15 uh, topics that we cover with the ergo bulletins, and again, mm -hmm. available in English and Spanish. Yeah. And we at the Institute love partnering with you to make sure that those safety <laughs> alerts and ergonomic <laughs> bulletins are available <laughs> in Spanish. And I can That's personally right. attest to how useful they are. I've definitely been sitting straighter, <laughs> adjusting my car and steering wheel to make sure everything is properly aligned. So they're That's definitely, right. definitely helpful. And we appreciate the work you folks are doing there. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, so why is it so important for everyone in the workplace to be properly trained from the newest employees to you know, supervisors, managers, all those folks? It's, uh, first and foremost, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, we, we talked about in the previous segment, we, we hope that e every worker comes to work uh, feeling well and goes home feeling mm -hmm. just as well at the end of the day. And, and, and a big part of that is teaching people how to do their jobs well and how to do their jobs safely. So we see safety training is, is very, very important. It's an investment that employers make, uh, whether it's a financial investment, an investment in time, an investment mm -hmm. in their people. And the dividends, that, the dividends that it pays, frankly, are usually uh, higher morale, better productivity. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it helps them, it, reducing accidents reduces claims. It helps employers manage their costs. So there are a whole lot of good reasons besides OSHA says you have to do it. Um, there are many, many other good reasons to do it. Absolutely. And we try to support our policyholders in that. Yeah, listening to you two, it's, it seems like common business sense to, yeah, yeah absolutely. We hope. <laughs> um, so how do you verify that um, employee safety training is effective? There's many different ways that you can do it. Um, one of the ways is you can observe employees after the training. Mm -hmm. So if you have provided them, whether it's safety training or like on the job training, are they following the correct procedures? Mm -hmm. If they aren't, you could intervene and ask them some questions. Oh, I see that you're placing that widget in the, this press. Mm -hmm. 
interact with the individuals to see what's happening. The other things that can be done too is it could be some Q&A mm -hmm. um, during a training session. Um, there's other things that can be done such as actually having a written test afterwards. Mm -hmm. So if you had a written test, uh, when you do forklift training for example, one of the things that has to be done is a hands-on test. So the employee actually has to demonstrate that they can operate that forklift safety, mm -hmm. safely. And they have to do it for as many different forklifts that are in the facility. So it's not like you get trained on one forklift yeah. and you can use them all. You have to be trained on each specific okay. piece of equipment. So it's important to get them involved, mm -hmm. ask them questions, um, observe them, and then document the training. Um, you can also ask them for improvements. When we have our open seminars, one of the things that we often do is we ask, what did you like best about the session? What would you like to change? And we do get feedback. And we and, do take that feedback to heart. Yes. We, we, we review every single, of all the thousands of folks that we train, we review every single one of those seminar evaluations. Mm -hmm. And we do take things to heart other than people complaining about the food. But that's, that's <laughs> a good point because one of the things that we should mention is anyone attending our, our open seminars, we do provide food. So if it's early in the day, we provide breakfast. If it's later in the day, we provide a snack. Uh, all of our training uh, takes place at the Beacon Mutual Training Center uh, at One Beacon Center right off the airport connector. However, um, the OSHA 10 class for construction, uh, which is one of our more frequently held mm -hmm. classes, it's a very large class. It would be a bit much to hold at the center. Mm. So we hold that off-site at Cello's. And again, this training is at no additional charge to the policyholder and those attending the OSHA 10 sessions at Cellos, there's a breakfast, there's a lunch, so folks don't have to worry about what do I do to feed myself during the day. So they're hopefully well taken care of and well taught. Yeah, it sounds like you guys have thought of everything from the uh, needs assessment at the very beginning to making sure you're offering the right trainings to evaluating those trainings and even feeding your participants. I'm sure your, your um, policyholders are, are very pleased with their services. We hope so. We're <laughs> very proud of it. Yeah. Cool. So I know you mentioned the website. Did you want to talk a little bit more about any other online resources? But also the online university. So the online university where they can go, um, they can register to take any one of the over 100 courses that are available. Um, we have those, the safety alerts the ergonomic bulletins. Um, we also put different news articles up there. And we do try to stay on top of what's happening in the industry and put up any new information. Um, we have different links that we'll update. So if OSHA was to change a standard, we'll try to put the latest information up there. We have an employer news section and an employee, employee news section as well. Okay. And it, it, it varies, each department is represented on the website. So anyone who having claims questions or something, it's not all about loss mm -hmm. prevention as much as we okay. think it is most days. Uh, you know, people will find claimants, policyholders will find um, all sorts of information on our website in regards to any every aspect of our business, frankly. Yeah. And there are times that we have actually received questions from the website. So somebody will go onto our website and they'll have a question and it will get routed to us. So if they had a specific safety question, it will eventually, it will come to either myself or to Dave or one of the reps. And that way we're able to get back to the person that's asking the questions. Oh, that's wonderful. I promise you it doesn't go into a black hole. We, we see those emails every day and we respond to them. And what was that website again? www.beaconmutual.com. Um, so to, to wrap up for today, could you just tell us a little bit about how um, employers, I'm sorry, how employers can take advantage of Beacon Mutual's loss prevention services? Sure, there's any, it's several ways actually. First and foremost, if they have an assigned uh, loss prevention consultant, and many of our policyholders do, or an assigned ergonomist, they can simply reach out to, to, to those folks assigned to, the, to their policy. Um, they can ask for any service through their, through their, their assigned contacts. Okay. They can also call Michael or, or myself. They can call the loss prevention department at area code 401-825-2667. They can utilize www.beaconmutual.com, the contact us section. Mm -hmm. They can send an email to us right, right through the website there. So, any service can be requested via the website, via phone, just give us a call. Yeah, it sounds like you're very accessible, so folks have no excuse not to get in touch. We, we can so. get to about 90, 95% of our policyholders within an hour. Wow, that's impressive. It is Rhode Island. <laughs> it's Rhode Island. I can't even get through yeah. to like cable in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's very impressive. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us again this evening. I really appreciate learning more about the services that um, are available to employers through your loss prevention department. And I hope to see you all again talking a little bit more about some of the health and safety concerns. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.
With the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, the country took a hard right turn. For decades, labor unions were an accepted part of the nation's economic fabric, but a transformation was coming. One of the unions formed as a result of President Kennedy's executive order allowing unions for federal workers was PATCO. In the 1980 election, this union endorsed Reagan. During the first year of his presidency, PATCO declared a strike and expected Reagan's support, but quickly learned otherwise. While the union did have a serious issue with understaffing and stress, the strike was a violation of federal law, and Reagan ordered the union to end the strike or he would fire the strikers. About 10% of the controllers went back to work, but the rest refused. The government had made an offer of significant pay increases, but the controllers thought they could get much more. Reagan fired all those who did not return and barred them from working for the federal government for life. It took years to bring the number of train controllers back to normal levels, but the government managed to muddle through. PATCO had badly misjudged the circumstances, especially lack of public support for the strike. The union was decertified in October of 1981. UAW leadership had argued that the concessions given to Chrysler in the bailout in 1980 were only a temporary fix to help save the company, but Chrysler labor costs were now $3 an hour below those of Ford and GM. In the midst of a recession and layoffs, by the end of 1982, the UAW had also granted Ford and GM huge contract concessions. The levy was breached. More and more corporations were moving manufacturing outside the United States, downsizing or closing their U.S. facilities, and thus weakening their union's negotiating strength. In this climate, corporations throughout the nation sought and received contract concessions, and in some cases, pursued strategies to get rid of their unions entirely. A heroic strike against the Phelps Dodge Copper Mining Company in Texas and Arizona in 1983 and 84 was broken through the use of replacement workers, violent clashes between strikers and Arizona State Police, and eventually a union decertification election in which the strikers, by law, were not allowed to vote. In 1986, the steelworkers engaged USX, formerly U.S. Steel, in a six-month struggle, two months longer than the big successful strike in 1959. But things were much different now. In 1959, the steelworkers struck the whole industry and shut down 90% of the country's production. In 1986, they took on USX by itself after having already granted concessions to several of its smaller competitors. Imports had become a major factor, and USX had become a conglomerate, able to maintain income from its non-steel enterprises during the strike. In the end, while the union was able to achieve some language against subcontracting, some guarantees of investments in the American steel industry, and lesser concessions than the company demanded, it nevertheless was forced to agree to wage and benefit concessions worth $2.45 an hour and the loss of 1,350 union jobs. The old strategies no longer worked now that management was prepared to permanently replace strikers and wait out the union. New tactics were needed, but top union leadership was slow to adapt. Local level union leaders were quicker to grasp the new reality. The best example is the strike of local P9 in Austin, Minnesota, against the Hormel Meatpacking Company. The union had agreed to concessions in 1978 in exchange for the company's agreement to construct a new modern plant in Austin. But when the company sought additional concessions in 1985, the workers struck. The local union had seen this confrontation coming and had begun strike preparations nearly a year in advance. With innovative road warriors taking their cause throughout the country, in a creative program called Adopt a Striking Hormel Family, P9 struggle generated national involvement. All told, some 3,000 labor organizations lent their support in one form or another. Unfortunately, the National Union feared a decertification election and undercut P9, 
accepting a contract that retained all the replacement workers. Lack of support from the parent organization undermined the creative tactics of the local union. The United Mine Workers demonstrated that these creative strategies could be effective when the whole union was committed to success. Its 1989 strike against the Pittston Company borrowed nonviolent civil disobedience tactics from the civil rights movement, including the takeover of a processing plant for four days. Road warriors took the struggle throughout the country, and thousands of union activists visited the union's Camp Solidarity. The miners' victory preserved health benefits for retirees, widows, and disabled miners. However, the devastation of the 1980s was dramatic. Unions entered the 1990s as only 15.5% of the workforce, and about a third of that was in the public sector. The most vigorous battle of the mid-1990s was fought when the A.E. Staley Company locked out its union of about 700 members. Located in Decatur, Illinois, this company was owned by a British conglomerate that sought serious concessions from the union the most onerous being rotating 12-hour shifts. The Union fought gallantly, using tactics learned from the Hormel and Pittston strikes, but the National Union provided only lukewarm support. After 30 months of struggle, a surrender faction within the local Union won control, and the National Union forced a vote on a concessionary contract and an end to the lockout. An example of a more successful struggle was a two-week nationwide strike by the Teamsters in 1997 against United Parcel Service, UPS. Under the leadership of recently elected reformer Ron Carey, solid preparation resulted in an effective strike that produced an agreement to convert 10,000 part-time jobs into full-time jobs. Realizing it was time for a change in leadership, in 1995, Many unions supported candidates running against the incumbent AFL-CIO administration that had been in charge since the merger of 1955. The insurgents were successful, electing John Sweeney as president, Rich Trumka as secretary-treasurer, and Linda Chavez-Thompson to the newly created position of executive vice president. The new leadership incorporated innovative thinking and attempted many initiatives aimed at reviving the labor movement. But the constituent unions remained focused on their own interests, and the new approaches met with limited success. Labor entered the new century quite weakened. Overall union membership was down to 13.4% of the workforce, and nearly 45% of that was in the public sector. Union negotiations now often consisted of trying to fend off employer demands for two-tier wage systems and for cuts in wages and benefits. The 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center caused a period of economic stress, and the Great Recession that began in 2007 led to the loss of half a million union jobs in manufacturing. In the auto industry, the government bailout of GM and Chrysler included further massive concessions. In 2010, another hard right turn in U.S. politics at the state level saw once heavily unionized Midwestern states wage an unprecedented war on public sector unions. Newly elected Republican governors with large legislative majorities passed legislation that gutted the legal structures under which public sector workers had organized and bargained contracts. In Wisconsin, Governor Walker's legislation wiped out years of benefit gains and decreed that public sector unions could only negotiate wages, not benefits or work rules. Labor's response was a three-week occupation of the state capitol building and as many as 150,000 protesters attending rallies. But Walker had the votes and forced through the changes. Four years later, Walker furthered his attack on unions by signing a right-to-work bill impacting private sector unions. After the steady expansion of union membership in the 1940s and 1950s, there has been a steep decline in the percentage of the workforce in unions. By 2010, only about 11% of workers were unionized. That decline in union membership has been accompanied by a drop in the share of income by American workers and the American middle class, 
and the lack of collective bargaining power is certainly a major contributor to growing income inequality. With all the problems unions face, there is still good news. Even as public employee unionism was under attack throughout the Midwest, the Chicago Teachers Union challenged this trend with a seven-day strike in September 2012. Months of preparation resulted in heavy membership involvement and support from most parents and neighborhood associations. The union fought against school closures and privatization, high-stakes testing, and overcrowded classrooms. The eventual settlement was a partial victory for the union that included pay raises, changes to teacher evaluations, and a better system for rehiring laid-off teachers. During the 2010 recession, the union at the Kohler Bathroom Fixtures Plant in Kohler, Wisconsin, was forced to accept a five-year wage freeze in a two-tier system that left new hires with very low pay and little in benefits. In November of 2015, 94% of the workforce voted to strike for our kids and grandkids. With strong support from the national union and the local community, the workers were able to substantially close the pay and benefits gap and achieve pay raises for everyone. This time, the strike only lasted a little over a month. Since the early days of our country, working people have struggled and sacrificed to gain the right to form unions. These early organizers understood that without unions, they were nothing more than a commodity in the marketplace. The poverty and suffering of working families was viewed by many as natural and inevitable. Business and allied political forces resisted bitterly and sometimes violently. And it took decades, but unions changed the nature of employment and, in many ways, the nature of our society. While the influence of unions is being assailed and reduced in much of the country, history teaches us that workers will fight on and continue in their struggle to organize. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.